Hello, everybody. This is the third and final um, competition lecture, um, and I wanted to go over more of a uh, quantitative model where we can look to see how competition works. And it's a graphical model, um, the Tillman's Consumer Resource Competition Models. It's um, a little heavy, so be careful as you're um, listening to this video, take some time, take some notes on it because um, I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly, but that's the good thing about this video, you can watch it several times. So to start out, um, let's define what a resource is. Um, a resource is, according to your book, there's two, two example or two definitions, a substance or factor which can lead to increased growth rates as its availability is increased in consumer, or entities which contribute positively to population growth and is consumed in the process, okay? So uh, basically it's something that gets consumed, eaten up, taken up, and makes the population grow when it does. So there can be biotic resources, which is, um, you know, things like prey, prey animals, um, but it might also be plants for herbivores, right? Could be seeds, could be, you know, anything that's living, right? Um, abiotic resources then are nutrients, light, and space. Um, in terrestrial environments, we usually don't consider oxygen um, a resource because, and you might think, well, why is that? Uh, well, oxygen, oxygen is never really limited in a terrestrial environment, right? So, you know, like the first part of this definition, um, does oxygen lead to increased growth rates? And the answer is, well, no, right? Like you increase slightly the amount of oxygen, it won't, well, oxygen is con constant across, you know, in a given sp space, uh, but it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't fluctuate. It also does, just doesn't increase growth rates. That's a, not true for aquatic systems where there are um, some places that oxygen would be considered a potential resource, but um, in terrestrial systems, it's not. Now, I also want to remember, remind you that this model is really talking about exploitative competition. That is, um, works pretty well for plants, um, and it's a way we can think about how um, competition can change things for um, for organisms that are in this consumer resource um, model. Now, how does it work? Let's look at this graph here. It's a graphical model that um, there, there's math behind it, but we I'm actually going to talk about it without really using any equations or any math. Um, Realize, though, that if you were to use this, you would need to do math. Uh, but we can look and see how um, populations can can grow and change in this competition model. So what we've got for this graph is resource availability. Okay, And this is then going to be the per capita birth rate for just one species. We'll add more species later on here, but um, first it makes sense to just talk about it one species. So what happens? Um, you know, at essentially zero resources, you get zero growth. Remember, per capita growth rate is like per individual, how many births per individual. So as you increase that resource, then the per capita birth rate increases, but eventually it flattens out, okay? That flattens out due to things like handling time or um, just, you know, then that resource is no longer limiting and it becomes a different different resource. What we need to add then on this thing is the per capita mortality baseline. The per capita mortality rate is, um, let, let's say it's independent of density of organisms here and just say, you know, a certain number of, of these organisms die each year and that's the same, um, you know, we can think about it each day or each minute. That's how many of these organisms are dying. So, um, what what this does then is it, it puts this death rate here and we get this thing called the R star at the point where the per capita birth rate line and the mortality line cross. So that's called R star. It means the you know um, the level of resources that are um, 
required for the minimum to, to sustain the population. Okay, the minimum resources to sustain the population. Okay, so basically what happens here is if you were to have a population that had, you know, resources at R star, um, the population is stable there. Okay, and how this works is because when the resources is, are above R star, the population grows and thus deplete the resource further and further. So you would kind of be going backwards on the graph until you reach this point where, um, you know, the resources are at some level, some level of like nitrogen in the ground, and the plants no longer increase in biomass or numbers or something. Uh, but, and if, if resources are less, the resources rebound and the population shrinks and the resources rebound up to a specific point. Okay, so let's add another species. Now let's say that this second species, um, the yellow species now, which I've uh, said, you know, um, yellow is species one, blue is species two. Um, let me ask you the question. Oh, sorry, their per capita birth rate is different. It responds differently to increases in resources. However, you put these two in, um, in, a, in a community together, who would win the competition? Remember that we're talking about exploitative competition. I'll let you think, pause the video, think about it for a second. All right, what you get though, is because the blue species has a lower R star, if you have a bunch of resources in the population or in the in the ecosystem, you would get a big population, which would then those would those would draw down the resources to the yellow R star. The thing about the yellow R star, though, is um, the blue is still going to be drawing resources, right? They're still going to be um, drawing resources and will pull the resource level below down to their R star. Thus, meaning that um, the blue line, that the blue species can survive at lower resources, say this is nitrogen in the soil, and um, eventually those resources would be pushed to that R, the blue R star, and which would over time then eliminate species one. Now, it's pretty interesting that, you know, there's different strategies going on here between these two species, the yellow species, um, grows better at high resources. So this is like an opportunist that, you know, just gobbles up the resources really crap quickly. Uh, but, but they're not a very good pe competitor, according to this model here. Or according to this line, they're not a very good competitor, right? The blue species is a better competitor. That's just, that this type of species we call a gleaner, basically like picking at the last little star straws. They do a good job growing at low resources. So given, you know, a stable situation, this is what we would see is the blue species would win here. The thing is, there's uh, some assumptions here that the mortality rates are equal, but, but you could easily put in another line for um, a mortality uh, rate for the other species. Uh, but it also requires like stable populations and stable conditions, which we know that's not reality. Reality, there's lots of different weather events, there's pathogens that can come in, and all of these things can kind of like reset the scenario and switch around what happens for uh, competition. And what, so what we can do is, you know, grow, if, if you were growing these two species together, um, given all stable conditions, we would expect blue to outcompete and eventually eliminate the yellow species. But when you have exogenous resource variability, now I know that's a kind of um, confusing word, but let's say all this is saying is that resources can change due to something outside of these species, right? So maybe it's like weather patterns, right? So um, if it's in California where you have windy or rainy uh rainy winters and hot dry summers right 
So maybe it's that um, the, the, the amount of rain comes and goes and comes and goes. And so if in the winter you have a lot of water availability, so that this resource is water, you would have the, the, in the winter potentially the yellow species doing better. But then when it switches over to the hot, dry summer and there's not a lot of water around, then you would get the blue species doing better. So, you know, and, and basically the weather switches back around before the yellow species essentially would get outcompeted. Um, and, and I should say, uh, it's not like the blue species is always out competing because here, and I put this, you know, on the yellow portion of this resource axis, um, anytime the yellow line is above, that means the yellow line is actually winning the competition. The yellow species is winning the competition. So, uh, resource availability, variability, um, doesn't like make competition weak. It's still happening in the background, but it just makes for different outcomes of that competition. Okay, now let's make it a little bit more complicated. Let's add two consume, or well, we have two consumers already, and we have two resources. Now this graph then is a little different now. What you have here is um, on the x-axis is resource two, resource one on the y-axis, you know, it doesn't matter which resources these are, but now the lines we're drawing here are not, um, you know, population size. What they're called is, or th these are the mortality rate lines, basically. So, um, well, I shouldn't say mortality rate. What, what, what they're called are zero net growth isoclines. Okay. And at any point along this isocline, the isocline is this L-shaped uh, line here, uh, the population is at equilibrium, right? So if, a pop uh, if the resources are such that you have, you know, a whole lot of resource two, but not very much resource one, so that would be like over here in the graph, the population isn't going to grow because it doesn't have enough resource one. But if the resources are somewhere in, um, in here, then the population would be growing, okay? So, it's, and essentially what these, these lines are, are they're put at the R stars, okay? So this is the R star for resource two, is right along here, and then this is the R star for resource one. What you need then is also a supply point. So, it's uh, it's basically like how the resources are coming back into the environment, okay? And if we have here, the resources are coming in at relatively um, equal amounts, but if this S were over here, that means resource one comes in a lot more than um, at resource two. So you might think, well, wh what are we talking about these resources like being supplied to the ecosystem? And, and th that, you know, if we're talking about, you know, maybe a predator, it could be their prey. Their prey are, um, you know, born at a specific rate, so they're continuously supplied to, to the ecosystem. But it could be just like nitrogen and the level of nitrogen fixation that's going on in the soils. Then we need to add the consumption back. Okay, and um, well, each species should have one consumption vector. And I've drawn like two scenarios here, but for this light blue species, where we have a um, zero net growth isocline here, um, if you were, if the consumption vector was, you know, more up here, um, that, what that means is it uses more resource one than resource two. If your consumption vector is here, it uses more of resource two. So these are all of the things we need for when we're talking about these different, um, this, this, this scenario here. So here is two zero net growth isoclines put on this graph. We've got a red species and a black species. Now remember that this red line the vertical red line is looking for the resource for um, the R star for resource two. And um, 
the horizontal line is looking at the um, R star for resource one. So what we see is the red species has R stars that are lower for both species. So pretty much at any time, you're going to have red species winning here, right? Winning in a comp competition because that red species will always uh, be able to grow at lower lower um, at lower resource amounts than the black species. And then it's you know just opposite here, where if you have the black below the red, or to the left and below the red, then the black species will win. Where it gets interesting then is where you have them crossing. Okay, so what this is saying is for the black species, it doesn't need that much resource one, but it needs a decent amount of resource two. This one um, doesn't, the red one doesn't need much resource two, but it needs a lot more resource one. And what we see is we get some equilibrium possible based on um, the uh, based on the consumption vectors. Now, if you were to switch the consum uh, consumption vectors, that's what we'll talk about here next. So we've got this scenario where we've got the red species um, crossing the zero net iso zero net growth isocline for the red species crossing the one for the black and um, the consumption vector. So this is the consumption vector for the red. This is the consumption vector for the black. So if and what the outcome of the competition depends on the resource supply for you. And that's the kind of weird thing about this. So if your resources are supplied at such that it's somewhere at this level, um, nothing's going to grow, right? You're not, everybody loses here because um, the resources, once they're used up and they're supplied at, you know, this down here, it's below the R star for both species and neither species are going to be able to grow. If you put it at two, if if the supply resource if the supply resource supply point sorry were to be somewhere in region two and that mean, what that means is um, you know somewhere in this box here um, the red species would be to win because the the resources would be supplied to such that it's still to the left below the R star for for this resource for the black species so the red species would win. So not surprisingly, then, if the resource supply location is in number five, or sorry, number six, the black species win because it's below the R star for the red species. Now, this is where it gets tricky. If you put the supply location here in region three, this triangle here, what you get is because of the, uh, the um, resource consumption vector, the red would essentially, the red species would draw the resources to the left of the black zero net growth isocline and thus eventually eliminate the, the species. Because even though the resources are, resources are continually supplied somewhere in this area, the resources would be drawn down to below this um, isocline there. And then the opposite is true in region five, where you've got in this triangle, um, the, the black species would draw those resources below the, the red isocline and thus eliminating the red species. But if the supply point is um, somewhere in between these consumption vectors, that you'll get a stable equilibrium. Basically what happens is the, uh, the both species draw the resources down to this point right here. And that means then we're hitting the R star for both species um, on one of their resources. So, um, you know, at this point, the black, if the resources are at this level, the black species can't grow, the red species can't grow, at least the population can't get bigger, right? So that uh, we get a stable equilibrium. Now, 
look what happened. I changed those resource vectors. So uh, the consumption vectors. So the black, if you look at the one before, oops, the red one is on top here, right? And the black one is on top here. So I've changed the, the orientation of those. Now, the, the answers for 1 through 5, or sorry, 1, 2, 6, 3, and 5 are, um, are the same. But 4 is a little different. If your resource um, here, if your resource supply point is somewhere in resource region 4, what happens is the resources get drawn back down to here. Um, and it's an equilibrium, but it's an unstable equilibrium. Okay, and what this is saying is that each species consumes the resource that limits the other species the most. Okay, and what an e unstable equilibrium is, is, um, well, let's talk about a stable equilibrium first. Now imagine you have this ball in this little cup and you push the ball just a little bit. What happens to the ball? It rolls up a little bit and then it kind of zigzags back and forth until it stops right here. So that's stable equilibrium. If you have it here, a ball on top of a hill, if you just push it a little bit, if you perturb the system a little bit, this falls off and it never goes back to equilibrium. So you get, in this sense, you know, this is the red species winning, this is the black species winning. Now, what you get then is this unstable equilibrium when the black black line is on top, the consumption vector is on top over the red line. Because each species is consuming the resource that limits the other species most. So any perturbation you get if you uh, perturb up, you know, up, you're going to get the red species winning. If you perturb it down, the black species will eventually win. So the answer is like we understand that that you can get coexistence in when when you have the consumption vectors in the right way. Um, but what this is saying, and your book talks about this a lot, that um, coexistence requires interspecific competition to be weaker than intraspecific competition, and. Um, that's a really confusing statement, and it's like doesn't really make sense to me um, unless you look at it in in this sense here. Okay, so what happens if intraspecific is stronger? If intraspecific competition is stronger, when you get to this equilibrium point, the species will then essentially be self-limited. Okay, because the 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 individuals of like the red species will be competing more with red species, other individuals in the red species, and not with the black species. So they won't be able to take over, right? Because any any more increase will actually increase the intraspecific competition and reduce the population size. However, if interspecific competition is stronger. Um, if one species gains the upper hand, it just strengthens that, um, you know, the one-sidedness of the competition, and it won't essentially be um, stopped by itself, and it'll eventually um, compete until the other one goes goes away, is, is eliminated. So in these graphs here, interspecific, um, uh, in, here is intraspecific, competition being stronger. Here is interspecific competition being stronger. So go over that, listen to that one more time, um, and think about it, and then it'll help you a little bit. So to summarize this on our star model, kind of the, the, the big thing to remember is whoever, whichever species has the lowest R star will win. Um, you know, it's a little more confusing when you have two more resources, but it's still based on those lowering of R stars. Um, the the R star model kind of assumes stability. It assumes that populations are not growing um, really quickly, or um, there's not disturbances coming in that will uh, mess things up. 
but there's a lot of broken assumptions here. Um, there's, you know, the supply point can change through space and time. And we kind of talked about that over here where, you know, if we have that situation where water is available more during the winter, that will put the resource availability up to here and allow the yellow to, to win in the winter and the blue to win in the summer when water is really rare. Um, so just varying the supply point can create coexistence. Um, one other thing is that mortality is really never constant. There's a lot of density dependent factors that can increase mortality um, or decrease it potentially. Um, and, you know, that's really weather dependent. It's never really a, always a, a constant. So this has kind of led to the question in a lot of ecologists is, can competition affect the community in fluctuating conditions? And the answer is, um, while the community maybe the, the conditions are fluctuating, competition is still affecting the community, right? It's not to say that, you, you know, in this example where we're varying water from the winter to the summer, we're still saying that competition is affecting. It's just as strong. It's just having different outcomes, right? Just because yellow wins when there's lots of water and blue wins when there's not a lot of water, that doesn't mean that competition isn't having an effect. It's having a very strong effect. It's just flip-flopping between one context and another. So competition is affecting communities. It just might have a, be having fluctuating results. With that, um, that's all, and see you later.